for those of you who know, Craft Lake City um, is a local nonprofit organization whose uh, focus is, oh, sorry, I guess we'll start, we'll start with the notes, actually. So um, just kind of a house, house cleaning. Please keep your microphone on mute. Um, if you have any questions, please type it in the chat and we'll make sure and get that to you, uh, get to your question throughout the um, presentation, at the, at the end of the presentation. And then we'll also be emailing you a survey after the event. And we'd love to get your feedback about how this event went for you. We're always looking for ways that we can be better and improve. So thank you again for attending Craft Lake City's Application Assistance Day event. So the mission of Craft Lake City as our, five, as our local nonprofit 501c3 is to educate, promote, and inspire local artisans while elevating the creative culture of Utah arts community through science, technology, and art. Um, we do this a few different ways for, through our programming. Um, first of all, right now, we're really kind of focusing on virtual programming since um, COVID and everything like that. So we've really been able to kind of expand upon our virtual programming through live streaming workshops. These workshops are taught by some of Utah's most skilled artisans. Um, topics range from gourmet food to floral arranging to fiber arts. Uh, we have a couple upcoming exciting workshops. If you're interested, we have clay jewelry with Jacqueline Whitmore of Obnoxious Plastics on Thursday, March 18th. And we also have a DIY skincare with Alicia Arnold of Define Skin on March 25th. So you can find out more information about those programs on our website. Um, we also offer Craft Lake City workshops. We have our online craft workshops that are rec pre-recorded that you can access at your leisure. Those are also taught by local talented artisans. We have dyed silk scarves, feminist embroidery, constellations, and felt wall hangings. Um, so you can get a lot of uh, different craft workshops online. We also offer STEM Kids online workshops. This is a kind of a program that started with Google Fiber where we took STEM nights into local Title I schools. Um, these have been recorded and are now posted on our website for at-home learning. So you can access those also on our websites. Craft Lake City also curates different art projects in downtown Salt Lake City. Um, we have Celebration of the Hand and Local Voices. Um, these exhibits and installations run along Broadway, which is 300 South between 200 East and 200 West. And right now we have local artist Laya Yang who um, up as our celebration of the hand and she creates mirror helmets and then takes photographs of these mirror helmets um, in uh, the lands landscape of Utah. Um, so those are beautiful um, exhibits. Take a, take a look when you get a chance. We also have our two main festivals that you probably are the most familiar with. We have the Craft Lake City DIY Festival and we also have the Craft Lake City Holiday Market, which is, happens in the winter at the Monarch in Ogden's Nine Rails Creative Distant, um, District. So the Craft Lake City Annual DIY Festival, sorry, the 13th Annual Craft Lake City DIY Festival will be held at the Utah State Fair Park. It was founded in 2009. It's a, one of Utah's largest local-centric three-day art festival. And um, this year, we are planning to hold the festival in person, um, but we will take extra precautions around COVID to create a safe environment for make makers and attendees based on the governmental COVID-19 guidelines. An online alternative format will be implemented if necessary for the health and well-being of our community. But as of right now, um, we are planning to be in person. And so we have a few important dates. April 8th is when our applications are due. Um, April 30th, we'll announce all of our participants, and then the actual festival will, will be held on Friday, August 13th, Saturday, August 14th, and Sunday, August 15th. So part of the DIY festival, we have a diversity and inclusion, we have many diversity and inclusion programs in the, at the DIY festival. The first is this Application Assistance Day, which you are attending now. We offer Kid Row scholarships and STEM scholarships, as well as have an artisan scholarship and mentor program and a sponsored families program. So to talk a little bit more about the application day um, and fee support. So basically this today, this event is free for anyone who just wants assistance with either the application process or maybe you want some photography tips. Um, we have today's event and we also are gonna offer another one on Monday, April 5th at 6 p.m. So if anyone who wasn't able to make it today um, needs assistance, 
we'll have another opportunity for them. And then we also have, um, we also offer application fee support for anyone who wants to apply but maybe has a barrier for the because of the application fee. So reach out to Craft Lake City for more information on that. Another one of our diversity and inclusion programs are the STEM and Kid Row scholarships. Craft Lake City offers financial scholarships for five uh, Kid Row applicants as well as five STEM participants. So you can reach out, you can find out more about these programs on our website or always you can reach out to us at info at craftlakecity.com. The next program I wanna talk about is our Artisan Scholarship and Mentor Program. This um, is for five first time DIY festival applicants. Um, they, you will get group and individual mentor training with seasoned makers. You get access to our online um, Craft Lake City Academy business training and you get waived fees for the program or for the waived fees for the, um, for the DIY festival. The only requirements is that you um, are 50% of the annual median income for your county. Um, those are all listed on our website if you have any questions about that. You must be a first time DIY festival participant and you must commit to the Artisan Scholarship events and requirements. These include about 10 classes of business, 10 Craft Lake City Academy business training classes and up to seven group and individual mentor meetings that happen before the festival and then a wrap up meeting after the festival. The next inclusion program that Craft Lake City um, employees at our DIY festival is the Sponsored Families Program. And we offer this to make sure that Utah families are able to attend and enjoy the festival. Um, each family is provided, we work with different community partners and each um, family is provided with festival tickets, food and beverage vouchers, kids craft vouchers, STEM craft vouchers, and Craft Lake City merchandise vouchers. So um, I'm gonna pass it over to Shelby Ling, our artisan coordinator um, and manager to talk more about why you should apply. Thanks so much, Amy. And thank you everyone for being here. Really, really nice to meet all of you virtually. And um, I'm excited to share with you a little bit more about the application process. Um, as Amy mentioned early in the call, if you do have any questions that come up, please type them in the chat. We're gonna have a section at the end where we address any and all questions that you might have. So um, we want this to be interactive, so please let us know. Um, so why should you apply to participate in the DIY festival? So there are a lot of benefits to participating. Um, here are some of the benefits that we've heard from other artisans that they've received from being a part of the DIY festival. You get great exposure. We have thousands of people who attend the DIY festival every year, some returning, some brand new. So it's a great way to get your work in front of a lot of people who are in the community who are interested in supporting the local creative economy. Um, networking. So while it's great to sell your work to people who are attending, it's also really awesome to meet other creatives. Um, we have such an, an incredible creative community full of people willing to work with one another. And it's just a really fun event and great way for you to get to meet other makers. Um, getting feedback. This is something that's so important. Um, maybe you create, you know, three or four different types of objects or inventions, or you're a performer. Um, getting feedback from the public about your work can be really helpful. Uh, we've had a lot of artisans who have received commissions from the festival. So someone sees their work and wants them to create something special. Uh, that happens quite often at the festival. Um, many of our, our participants also are invited to uh, take part in other community events and markets and festivals. And then it also helps with the growth of your business. So you don't have to take our word for it. Um, here are a couple of testimonials we have. I'll just read these quickly um, from the past. One artisan said, I've gained unique and diverse followers through the networking made possible by Craft Lake City. It affords you the face-to-face -face opportunity to discuss your business and its products with a captive audience who are not only willing to support you, but are looking to support you. Um, another artisan said, thank you for taking a chance on new artists such as myself. Your trust and faith in us is so validating and motivating. The exposure I got 
God from having the opportunity to display and sell at Craft Lake City is immeasurably positive, and I will be forever grateful for the boost y'all gave me to put myself out there and create at a rate I've never before achieved. Um, we love surveys at Craft Lake, and we do a survey at the end of every festival. Um, the last time we were in person in 2019, 75% of the exhibitors said that Craft Lake City helped their business grow. So um, that's part of our mission and part of what we aim to do with the festival. So, okay, what do you need to know before you apply? One of the things you need to know, which might seem obvious, but I'm just gonna show you all, is how to navigate our website. Where do you go in order to apply? So let me just take you on a little quick tour here. Can everybody see this? Can you give me like a thumbs up if you can? Okay, cool. So this is uh, craftlakecity.com. This is our main homepage. You can see that we've gone ahead and added this pop-up right here where you can just click and apply right from the homepage. But if you don't see that pop-up, this is what our homepage looks like. You can scroll right down here and actually click on this image to apply or the supply here button. We also, let me expand this a little bit have a menu up here on the top. So we have a little DIY festival button here that you can click to apply now. You can get application info, kid row information, the inclusion program that Amy talked about all on our website. And then we also have the little hamburger up here in the upper right corner with all of our menu items. There's a few different places you can go, but I'll show you a couple of them. One is the main DIY festival webpage. So this is our fun 13th annual Craft Lake City DIY festival presented by Harmon's homepage. Uh, we update this constantly. So right now we have information about applications. This is the timeline over here on the right that Amy already went over. Um, the applications close at 11.59 p.m. and they actually close at that time on April 8th, which is a Thursday. And then we announce all the participants on April 30th. Um, the festival itself takes place Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, August 13th, 14th, and 15th. And we've got the hours listed here too. So you can come right to this page and there's an application button right here. You can also find more information. We're gonna have another virtual application assistance day on the 5th. We've got scholarship application here for more info and details. If you guys know any cute little kid artisans, 14 and under, please encourage their parents to help them apply. It's the most adorable part of the festival. Um, and then we also have volunteers. If you have friends, family members that wanna take part in the festival or maybe want to sponsor part of the festival since we are a nonprofit, all that information is available here on our Craft Lake City DIY Festival homepage. Um, a couple of other really important parts um, to look at are, let's see here application info. So we have something called the festival application and prospectus. This page is where all the info you could ever want about applications is held. So we've got um, a description of the festival, a reminder about all the application deadlines, a link to the application, and the different categories that you can participate in. So we have artisans um, who make handmade items and vintage vendors, craft and commercial food vendors, and there's descriptions of what those are, um, DIY engineers, tinkerers, and STEM exhibitors, kid row artisans and performers. So all this information, you can just click on which one you're looking for and it'll take you to that section where it talks about eligibility, um, what the different rules and regulations are for applying, uh, the different categories and descriptions of those in case you have questions. Uh, the vendor fees are listed here, the different types of spaces we'll have. So um, we have so much information here that I won't read all of it here during the meeting, but just know that this is here for you. It's, it's a reference that's available for every type of participant. We have all those details there. And let's see. We also have, of course, the application link. So this little apply now button, let's go ahead and check this out. So this is what you'll see when you go to our website and you click on apply. This is our application portal here. So um, if you scroll down, there's some details here. There's a link to that prospectus we just looked at and also a reminder about the deadline. And then there's two spaces. So if you've already started an application, which I have, <laughs> so you 
you'll see that I've got my login credentials here. And if you've already started your application for 2021, you can log in right here with your username and password. Um, one thing that's important to note is that if you have applied in the past or participated in the past, that login does not carry over year to year. So you will need to create a new login each year. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and click this get started now green button to start an application just so you can see what that looks like. So this is kind of the primary page. The first thing you're going to do is select which type of participant you are. So are you an artisan, a craft food artisan, STEM, a performer, a kid row artisan, or really a parent of a kid row artisan, um, or commercial food vendor. So uh, many people we work with, I mean, all of you are so talented and many people do more than one thing. So we actually have some artisans who have participated in the past who are also in a band or are performers. We have DIY engineers who um, also are co-owners of a craft food business. So if that's the case for you, you will need to submit two separate applications. Um, so if, you, if you're in two different categories of participants. That being said, if you are an artisan and you create more than one type of work, but it's still under that artisan category, you can still just submit the one artisan application. So it's just if you're in a different type of participant category that you really need to submit two separate applications. And let me know if you have any other questions about that. I'm happy to talk about it more. And then basically it's pretty self-explanatory. You put your email in, you choose a password, you re-enter your password, and then we've got the prove you're not a robot CAPTCHA down here, save and continue, and it'll take you into the application. So I can kind of show you really quickly, we won't go through every application, but just look at, oh, nope, it's going to be like, no, that's not happening right now. There we go. So this is kind of what it looks like here. You've got all this information, all of these different um, fields that you can complete. Uh, in order to do your application, you will know if you have some missing components because it'll come up in red and say, hey, we still need this information from you. So we've got one, two, three, four different um, tabs here at the top, the your information section, application question. See, it's in red because I haven't completed it yet. It's telling me I'm required to complete those fields. Product images, which we'll talk about in a little bit that you'll need to upload five of those. And then also um, the $20 application fee payment. Um, it's something that it's non-refundable. It helps us uh, with our costs associated with uh, the festival and with you know looking through all the applications and helping with the during process. So it supports our, our nonprofit budget. Um, and then this agreement here, which you'll get a copy of emailed to you. So that's it really. So it's, it's not too crazy. Um, but if you ever have any questions, please reach out because we are here to help you. Let's see here. What else do you need to know? So eligibility, as I mentioned, this is available in the prospectus, but let's just go over a few key points. Um, so in order to participate, you need to be either an artisan, a performer, a foodie or a STEM engineer or a Kid Row artisan or the parent of a Kid Row artisan. Um, we really take pride in the fact that Craft Lake City is a local centric event. We, our mission is to elevate the creative culture of Utah. So in order to participate in the festival and to be eligible, you do need to reside and operate your business in Utah. Uh, so we want it to be local. It's something that really sets our event apart. Uh, you also need to create original handcrafted work. That's something that we um, prioritize. And um, we can talk more about what that means if you have questions. And uh, we also need to make sure that any images, information, performance links that you include in your application are representative of what you're going to sell at the DIY festival. Um, and then also, of course, you have to be able to submit your application on time with that fee in order for our jury to look over it. So here are some of the fees. Um, these again are available on that prospectus, but just to go over them quickly, um, something that's really important to note is that these fees are wide ranging because they depend on the type of space that you have, the exhibitor type that you are, and also the number of days that you participate. So that's why there's such a wide range here, um, but you can find more details about what that means on the prospectus and see where you would fit in. 
So as uh, Amy mentioned, if those fees are a barrier, we do have scholarships available, STEM scholarships, Kid Row scholarships, and artisan scholarships. So if you're interested in applying for a scholarship, you meet all of those eligibility requirements. Essentially, here's what you need to do in order to do that. You apply to the DIY festival by April 8th through the process we just reviewed on the website. Kid Row applicants, you'll actually be able to complete all of your scholarship questions in your regular participant application. So Kid Row, scholar, Kid Row applicants, you do it all at the same time. For artisans in STEM, you apply to the festival by April 8th, and then Craft Lake City will email you a separate scholarship form. There's no fee to submit the scholarship form, but it is a separate form just because it has specific eligibility questions in it, and that needs to be completed by April 16th. So you get about a little over a week after the regular applications are due to complete your scholarship application. Um, you may be asked to do a phone interview, um, and then once the applicants are juried into the festival, uh, the scholars are also selected and everyone is notified about their status, both about participating in the festival and their scholarship on April 30th. And we do require that all of the scholars, um, that the artisan scholars, since that's a larger program, participate in all associated programs and trainings. As Amy mentioned, there are 10 trainings that happen uh, on Tuesday and Thursday evenings between the end of May and end of June. So that's something to keep in mind. We have a few others. Um, details are on the website, but it's a really amazing program, a great way to launch your creative business if you are an emerging artisan. So uh, really quickly to kind of talk a little bit about the jurying process. So our applications for artisans are juried by an anonymous panel of local professionals. Uh, the jurors are not associated with Craft Lake City. Um, all of the exhibitor applications are anonymous to the jury. So that's something that's really cool where the jurors are anonymous and the applications they're reviewing are anonymous. So the only thing they see in your applications are your product photos, your product descriptions, and your product prices. And that's in order to make the application jurying process fair to everyone um, and also I will mention as well that the jury changes year to year. So if you apply and for some reason are not accepted this year, we encourage you to apply again next year uh, because you know the results are always different every year. Um, and then for STEM, Kid Row, foodies and performers, uh, after those applications close, uh, those are reviewed by specialists who work for Craft Lake City. So we have department managers who specialize in those areas and help curate those experiences at the festival. Okay, so um, a few application tips for you. So one thing uh, that I would love to recommend that is important is to think about your brand as a creative business or performing group. Um, so you need to think about any application that will say, what is your business name? So some people like to use their personal name as their artist name for their business name. Some people have a separate actual business name that they like to uh, sell their work under. So determine what you would like that to be. And also what your brand or the personality of your company might be and kind of weaving that brand throughout your entire application um, through your description, your images, and kind of, uh, and especially in your bio when you tell us who you are, what you make and why it matters. Um, so all of that should be connected together in a cohesive way. Um, we also would encourage you to consider establishing an online presence if you're interested. Um, it's not required, but if you have you know, an interest in having a, an online store or an Instagram account or another social media account that also ties into your brand, that can be really helpful because, let me show you the next slide, <laughs> Part of what our DIY festival participants receive uh, each year is an online exhibitor profile. So even though we're going to be um, most likely having this in-person DIY festival experience, you also get an online presence on the Craft Lake City website as a DIY festival participant. So this is a little preview over here on the right side of the screen of what that means. Um, it's almost like a social media profile, but it's on our website. So 
has your business name um, and kind of a profile picture, you could say a link to your online store, and then also links to your social sites and some of your products as well. So all of this information is actually pulled from your application. Uh, and then it can be updated later on, but it's really best to think of this when you're applying so that you have a really great and effective online profile in addition to a strong application. Okay, so for the jurors, focus on your products. That would be my number one recommendation. So really showcase what you make. So in your application, uh, you'll be asked to submit five examples of products that you make. So pick the five best photos you have of your, of your products. If you sell more than one type of product, like let's say you make bath bombs, and then you also make, you know, prints, you'll want to make sure that you have examples of each of those um, in the product photos you submit. So you want to make sure you have at least one photo of your bath bombs that you submit and one photo of your prints that you submit. That way your application is reflective of what people will see if you're selected to participate in the festival. We also have a cool blog post. Let's see if this will let me link. Yay, um, that we did with Picture Line last year that kind of gives an overview of recommendations for taking better photos with your phone for low or no cost. And this is linked in the prospectus. So it just gives some tips and tricks here. And um, also we will have, of course, Heather, who's incredible from HWorks, sharing a few other recommendations with us, but that's there for you if you need it. Um, descriptions are important as well. So writing a brief and engaging description of your products. So there is a character limit and that's something I would urge you to pay attention to. Um, sometimes, um, you know, we can get, we can get writing a description and not pay attention. And then we get applications that are cut off mid sentence and we really want to know more. <laughs> so be mindful of that. It's about 255 characters. Um, and you can really talk about what your products are. Uh, there are a couple of questions about the handmade components of your products if you're an artisan uh, or a STEM exhibitor or a foodie. So when you're asked about that, um, you know, sometimes people respond, yes, it's handmade, um, which is fine, but it really does help our jurors if you expand a little bit more on that. So for example, if you are a graphic designer or a digital artist and you create a design and then you have it printed uh, separately and you sell the prints, you may not have made you know, the print itself or the paper itself, but you made the design. So that's something that's really um, important for our jurors to know. Um, and then pricing. This is something we get questions about so often with products. So uh, what we recommend is finding a balance. So you don't want uh, the, the products um, that you sell at the festival, festival to be so expensive that they are cost prohibitive for some of the attendees, but you also don't want to devalue your work. We see a lot of individuals who apply, they have these really awesome products, but uh, they actually price them fairly low. So we would recommend doing a little bit of research, see what other artists who sell similar products are charging for their products and kind of make an educated decision there. Let's see here. Um, so some important application components just to review for artisans, uh, the product photos, descriptions, um, are really important. The prices, the description about how they're made, all important. For foodies, same thing. Products, descriptions, company bio, describing the handmade aspects. For performers, your bio, music links and band photos are really important. And then for STEM, um, we also ask for product photos and descriptions, but also providing a, a sense of excitement and discovery for STEM and what educational components you might provide within the Google Fiber STEM building if you're selected, and then product photos and descriptions. So I'm sure you're seeing you know, a theme here, product photos and descriptions are really important. So um, Heather is going to talk a little bit about uh, her tips um, for product photography as a local artisan. Um, but right before she does, I wanted to show just a few examples of some of the things we've seen in applications in the past, um, some common um, 
you know, issues that people may have encountered and then some, some solutions for that. So um, I did not take these photos. These are, <laughs> these are beautiful photos um, taken by past DIY festival artisans. I did, however, take some of the next photos coming up, not all of them. But just to show you, so I am not a professional photographer, um, but lighting is a really big thing that's important that Heather will talk about a little bit. So over here on the left, you can see these two photos I took. Um, I bought a beautiful ring from Peach Treats uh, a, a couple of years ago. And you can see how here um, in the photos I took, the lighting kind of prevents people from seeing exactly what the ring is. Um, that photo on the left is kind of dark and the shadows kind of hide exactly what the ring looks like. On the right, it's actually Actually really overexposed. So it sort of distorts what the ring looks like. It doesn't actually look like that. <laughs> so then the photo on the right here, this was taken by um, John Carlisle, who's on our board and is also a photographer. Um, and he used some bright natural light. And you can really see clearly that these wooden objects, what they look like and um, without any kind of uncertainty. So, and it's just the lighting really is what makes that difference there. Um, backgrounds are something that um, can make a big difference. So in this photo I took on the left, this is a actually a really gorgeous necklace I got from Kelly Mellis in the past. Um, and it's taken on my carpet and you can see how the carpet is so busy that it kind of distorts um, you can't really focus on the actual object itself because it's competing with that background. Whereas this photo on the right from a Craft Lake City artisan um, is just against this simple background. So you can really see what that necklace looks like without any uncertainty. And it kind of just helps showcase the art, the, the art object. Um, and then filters, that's a big thing in editing, something that Heather will talk a little bit about. Um, this photo I took on the left of some clay earrings I bought from an artist named Tiny Messy. Um, and I actually went on my phone and I just like selected an Instagram a filter um, at like full power. And it actually distorted the color of the product. The product doesn't actually look like this. It looks, um, it looks quite different, but because of the filter I used, it kind of distorted it. So if you were to go look at this object, you know, if I were wearing them, you would see like, oh, actually it doesn't look like that. So um, simplicity in the editing, I think a lot of times is key. This image on the right from Asana Natural Arts, um, you know, really doesn't like overdo it on filters. You can see very clearly what this necklace looks like. And then lastly, some cropping. So there are a lot of reasons why you might want to crop or stage something in a creative way. I think that makes um, a, a lot of sense for social media, for marketing images, but for an application, it's really important for the jurors to be able to see what the object is in its entirety. So um, this one on the left I took again of that necklace um, is cropped. It's also kind of blurry, it's out of focus and you can't, you wouldn't know looking at this how long that necklace is or necessarily that it's even a necklace. It could be a keychain, could be something else. Whereas this image on the right of this adorable fox pillow by B Customs Creations, um, you can clearly see that it's a fox and that it's a pillow. Um, and another thing Heather will kind of talk about is you can also do things to add a sense of scale to these photos too. Like if it's, you know, this necklace on the left, maybe it could be someone wearing the necklace. You can see how large it is. So you know that it's, oh, it's actually four inches, not four feet tall. <laughs> so those are just a few really quick um, observations and recommendations. But um, we're so lucky to have Heather from HWorks Jewelry here. Heather is such a talented local maker uh, and has participated in the DIY festival many times in the past. She's a jewelry maker. You actually can't really see this because of the filter, but I'm wearing one of her headpieces right now. I'm obsessed with her work. She takes really great photos. So she's here to kind of share some tips and tricks with us. So thank you, Heather. Hi, am I here? <laughs> okay, great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here and giving me the opportunity to share some of the um, methods I've basically stumbled through discovering through many years of trying to do this. Um, also, I'm just really enamored by Craft Lake and think they do incredible things for our community. And I'm I'll, another reason I'm happy to be here. Uh, let me see. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you if I can remember how. Um, here we go. Did that work? Thumbs up if it worked, maybe. Can you see the PowerPoint? Okay, thanks. 
Okay, so um, this is just the text you'll see on Craft Lake's application page when it comes to the time to add your images. And so the things I feel like are worth highlighting are you're choosing five images. Um, keep in mind that file size. And then I didn't know this until today. So it's good to know that it's going to be cropped into a square after you submit them. And most of my photos, as you'll see, are actually in the portrait um, style. And so it would be easy. It's good for me to know that because I'm going to need to lower the, the focus, meaning bring down the top frame of my focus to be able to make sure the majority of my product doesn't just get cut off as I submit. Uh, all right, next slide. So I, I use a very minimal um, approach to my photography process. I have a white wall painted in my bedroom. Well, I have white walls. I like my bedroom because of where the natural light hits from multiple windows. I use natural light. I use my iPhone camera. My personally preferred editing app for my iPhone, and I assume it would work on Android, is the Lightroom app. Um, I purchased something called a preset through, which is a filter that you can upload into Lightroom. I bought mine on Etsy and they are everywhere. You can find any type of preset that suits your needs and apply that to Lightroom. I also use a blurring app, which um, kind of just skews the background or the surrounding area around my product, which helps my product look more crisp in comparison to that background. Um, some thoughts for the photo itself. There's uh, only a little set of hours during the day that I can get a picture that I enjoy because I specifically don't use a flash and I like to utilize the light of the day because I think it gives the best effect without needing any setup. Don't stand too close to the wall. Um, the closer you, or put your product too close to the wall, the closer you are to the wall, the more you get the texture of the wall. If you move back a few feet from the wall, it will, my iPhone camera seems to naturally blur that texture on the wall. You need to take a little minute as you look through your screen at what your image will be, because you can really manipulate the reduce of, reduction of glare I, I make jewelry, so I often can see myself in the jewelry, which I don't want in my photo. So just like twisting my body a little bit or moving my hand in the light, well, meaning I'm wearing a ring. If I move it a certain way, then I'm no longer being reflected in the ring. So that would help. That's how I utilize positioning. Um, it, I think it's really important to eliminate any personal branding or personal identifying features because it's um, kind of makes you more known in the the application process, which is something we're trying to avoid to help with the anonymity of the process. Um, <laughs> something that took me a long time to learn is there's a really big difference in image quality of your photo if you're using a front-facing camera or a rear-facing, which I take all my own photos, so I'm often facing myself in my phone, trying to move my body to get a photo my face isn't in, and then I'm cropping that, and then I'm realizing, oh, I've lost my image quality. So if you can have someone help you, if you have to be in the photo yourself, you'll get a much better quality image for post-production. Okay, here's on the right, a picture of me in my bedroom, taking a picture of myself wearing my rings. And then on the left, you're getting the image of what I've taken. This is an unedited image, but I mean, honestly, I walk in my bedroom during the daylight hours and I stand in a certain spot and I take the photo on my iPhone. That's like literally choosing the time of day is the most photo equipment I use. Um, it, I, I do jewelry, so it's natural for me to be wearing my product. Um, and I realize a lot of people aren't going to be wearing their art possibly. And so an easy hack around that is this is just two blank canvases that I bought at um, Peterson Art Center or, you know, Michael's, wherever you buy canvases. It's just literally sitting on top of my nightstand with another one behind it um, to create my background. And on the right, you see a very unedited photo of what that actually looks like. So it's a great way of getting a white background and a white base. And if I were 
editing this photo, that blurring effect I mentioned earlier would really reduce that seam line you're seeing where the two canvases come together. You could also hang this canvas on a colored, a darker colored wall, or um, it's just a great way to quickly put up a white surface or Shelby mentioned even a white piece of paper. Um, there are some pretty inexpensive light, inexpensive light boxes you can also get. It's just not something I use, but your product might be better situated sitting inside of a light box. So it's something to possibly research if you need. Um, on the left is a completely unedited photo. On the right, I've used Lightroom, my pre -fil um, preset filter and the blurring effect. So you can kind of see the three main steps I use. Um, just pointing out again, if I were standing closer to the wall, you would see all that texture in my wall. So just I'm just like a foot or two away from my wall. Um, a comment on that pre preset, I keep mixing the words up, the preset, which is a filter. Um, you want to make sure you're choosing something that suits your desires. My desires are to have a crisp white background and to also brighten up the light and also to not ruin the color of what I'm doing. And so you can see that I, my filter really, my preset, I'm using those words interchangeably. It, it does really lighten my colors, but hopefully I'm not wrong, but I can still see that this is a yellow toned brass. I have silver and I can still see that this is a pink toned copper. So that's something to keep in mind as you select your personal filter or preset idea to know that you don't want the colors completely changed. Okay, so once I've taken the photos, I put them through my basic editing process. I do this all on my iPhone. I upload the photo to the Lightroom app and there are tons of other apps available to you. I have in the past used VSCO. It's a great app that also you can purchase their presets through. Um, I find Lightroom to be more user-friendly for myself. Within Lightroom, I crop, rotate, position the image to my liking. I apply my preset, which I've uploaded. Like I said, I bought mine through Etsy. Just another reminder about making sure your colors are staying true. And then I export the photo from Lightroom to my photos. And that's when I blur. There's a, you just need, I mean, there's dime a dozen. It's specifically search for photo blurring app and you'll find something at basically just like, you choose the shape, you choose the blur. <laughs> I feel like they're user-friendly, so I won't try to explain that further, but hopefully that makes sense. I also sometimes do the blur beforehand before I apply my preset. Okay, um, on the left, you can see this lighting is natural. I have blurred the picture, but I have not applied the preset. Again, on the right, you see my preset. I used this to show you the difference in the editing process. However, I would not actually personally submit this picture to an application because it has my logo on it. And I should have just, I would just shoot this on a white square um, to still show the earrings, but not to give away who is submitting the picture. Here are basically I'm at the phase where I'm just gonna show you a bunch more photos that I've applied or applied with in the past or would choose if I were applying when, when I apply. So here's just one on the right where I used a copper bar to hold my earrings up. And I wanted to point this one out because just from turning toward the light of another window, you can see I'm getting some really great highlights on that. Um, it gives dimension. Um, there was a previous slide, these same earrings, it was the set of earrings that were on the canvas and there was like literally no dimension in that photo because I hadn't manipulated it to catch the light. Um, I'm just wearing my jewelry. I'm cropping out <laughs> as much of my face for more than one reason that I can. There's my self again, myself again. <laughs> but you can see how I'm really, especially in this hair one, I literally put the little circle of focus really tightly around these two hair clips and then just blurred as much as I could of the rest. And I know the blur is heavy handed, but I honestly don't find it personally distracting because all of my eyes look at when I look at that are my two hair clips. And I think that's important. So just more of my work. Here are two options for the same necklace. Here's me wearing this chain that I made and here's me holding it against a white background. I feel equally pleased with both photos. It's just a matter of um, preference if you were deciding 
Do I want them to see the white background or do I want to see it being worn? Here is the wearing more and then another necklace hanging against a white background. And really it's just those super simple steps of standing away from the wall, turning toward the light, and then that little quick post editing process I described. And that's that. <laughs> you can find me on my website at hworksjewelry.com or any social media at hworksjewelry. And um, just a few quick other things that I wanted to mention that I forgot to put in the slides. I want to reiter reiterate that I recommend turning off your flash so you don't get that overexposure. Um, Shelby mentioned scale. I, I kind of naturally have an implied scale because I'm wearing the product. Um, if you're doing yours on just a full white background and you don't feel like it's natural to have a pro another item in your photo for scale, I would really recommend you utilizing that item description to explain the size of your item. I think it's important to use a single product in each photo you're submitting. However, I have also used photos that in which I or I have photographed someone else wearing more than one piece. And those have been photos that have still um, I have been accepted over it. But the thing I do when I submit a photo that has more than one piece of jewelry being worn is I say the name of the piece, I say the ring, and then I say the price and the metal it's made out of. And so it's I use really sparse wording, but I very specifically say the earrings are this size and they're this much. The ring are this size and they're this much. And so I have used photos that have more than one item in them and it has not been something that prevented me from being accepted. Um, however, you don't want it to get so busy that there's just so much to look at that you lose the, the great attention your work should be receiving. I've been a juror in different shows and festivals. And so it's interesting. I have seen the back end of, of certain other events and I just want you to know that in that case, I had about two or three minutes or less to look at each submission of photos. And sometimes people would literally say, please go to my website to look at more of my product or they'd have their tags in it. And that felt a little icky ethically for me as a juror. It didn't mean I discounted their work, but I knew it was something they had been asked not to do. So I would just really reiterate that you make it easy on the juror to not have to like apply some sort of <laughs> process further than just appreciating the pictures you've shown. Um, also, they've said, oh gosh, I lost my train of thought, but basically don't, don't cluster your photos. Don't ask them to go look at other, like look at my website or see my Instagram because there, that won't happen during the jury process. There's literally no time. There's no other windows open. There's no time to click on any other reference they may have hoped you would look at to get a more broader view of their work. And so just remember that these five photos are all you really need to focus on. And hopefully um, some of the tips I've offered will help you feel a little better about doing that. Thank you so much, Heather. I have um, one question that might be obvious and silly, but I wanted to ask it anyways. Mm -hmm. um, so when you are photographing your pieces and you're using the blur, you mentioned that you, um, you kind of create or you identify in the app a section of your photograph that you don't want to be blurred. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So you just really yeah. want to make sure that if there is the blur being used that the product you're highlighting is crisp and clear? Yeah, so let me just designate that I have mentioned two separate um, topics about blurring. The first one is in when you take the raw photo, just making sure that you are aware that you're not seeing the texture of the wall, because just by positioning yourself, you can eliminate a lot of post editing by making sure you are taking a photo that doesn't have wall texture in it or canvas or whatever you're using. And then that's the photo. And then secondarily, when you go into one of these blurring apps, usually what it will do is offer you a shape. Usually I use a circle or an oval and you put the center of that shape over the item you want in, in focus. And then the, and then you're like sliding a scale and it's blurring the in and out of the frame around it. And so that's, that's a post editing thing. Is this a, specifically you would search for a photo blurring tool or a photo blurring app. 
And really it's just laying that circle of focus over your item and then blurring out the rest through basically like a sliding line on your picture. Yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much, Heather. Um, I love getting these tips from people that definitely things that I wouldn't think of. And uh, thanks for giving your, you know, all your um, insider tips too for the jurying process. I think that those are really things, important things uh, for folks to keep in mind. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple more things. I want to present one more time um, about the application process. Um, and if you have any other questions, please put them in the chat. We're going to get to those in just a couple minutes. So applications, like we've mentioned, are open right now until April 8th. So go ahead and go to our website. Um, and click the apply now or look at the prospectus and make sure you understand. Always feel free to reach out to us. I think the next slide we have our, our website is craftlakecity.com. You can call our phone number um, or email artisan coordinator at craftlakecity.com. Also, if you aren't following us on social media, media that's a great place to get um, all of our updates. So Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, and LinkedIn as well. So you can get all of our updates. So we did have a couple questions that were really good. So I think I'm gonna actually ask Shelby if you wanna, or actually Heather um, too, this is a photograph question. So it's a question for Kid Row. Um, product is letter keychains made of various colors of dried flowers, variety of single club colors. The photo instructions are to take three to five objects. Would we take pictures of various colors, letters? Um, they specify that there are no other resin products other than the alphabet offering. So I think the question is just asking um, maybe for variations of these photos. So um, yeah, Heather, would you like to yeah. take that one actually? Yeah, I think absolutely you would, even if it's five letter A's, but they each have a different flower or a different color, I would just showcase a different aspect per photo. Yeah, don't just put one photo. Um, give, give the juror something to look at. So yeah. Hopefully that answers that. Yeah, that's great, great info. Um, Shelby, did you have any other input about that question? No, I think that's perfect. So um, yeah, that's great. If the products are, are all similar, if it's all alphabets, but they are just as Heather said, different colors or different flowers, just making sure to showcase the diversity in the products that you have. So um, I think that exactly what Heather said, even if it's the same letter, letter if they all look different, um, one of each would be great. Um, and if we didn't answer that question um, entirely and you need more info on that, feel free to email us or give us a call or you can post again in the chat. We'll be on here for a few more minutes talking about some of these questions. Um, so the next question is, what exactly do you mean by 50% AMI? Um, so the AMI is the area median income um, of your specific county. And we actually have that on our website. If you go to our, and I can post this actually in the chat too, so you can bring it up, but it's under our Artisan Scholarship page. And we have a, um, an area, we have a bunch of information depending on what county you live in, there is a difference. So as long as you fall below that area median income, there are other questions on the application for the Artisan Scholarship and Mentor Program. Um, that, you know, ask how many people. So we do take more than just that into account, you know, how many people are in your household and things like that. So don't um, be scared away to fill out that application if you feel like you're too close. Go ahead and fill it out anyway. And there are many other questions that kind of help specify that. Right, and then the, another good question we have is, um, historically, is there an approximate percentage of applicants accepted? Shelby, would you like to address that one? Sure. So um, actually, the best way to answer this is to essentially say that it really depends. <laughs> it depends on a lot of different things about, uh, you know, how many individuals apply in each category. Um, it changes every year. So it's a little bit hard to identify exactly how many. Um, but what we can say is that individuals have the best chance of 
getting accepted if their applications are strong. So um, just kind of following all of all of the things that we're talking about today um, will kind of give you the best uh, the best opportunity uh, with a strong application to be accepted. Great, thanks Shelby. Um, and then we have another good question if you would like to address that one, Shelby, is how long will the exhibitor's profile remain active? Oh yeah, good question. So um, what's, what's really exciting is that uh, at least right now, it, it's just going to continue to live on our website. So you can actually go to our website and see exhibitor profiles from the past. Um, I believe they're on there from 2017. So you can go through and see exhibitors from 2017, 18, 19, and 20 um, in the DIY festival, and then 2019 and 2020 for the holiday market. Um, we actually did update the format of those profiles for the holiday market, and we'll be using that new format um, for the summer, which is really exciting because it has has uh, actual products that you can click on and expand and learn more about. So just more features, but it'll stay on the website um, for, for quite some time. Yes, I think even now um, on our website, we have past festivals archived on our website. So you, people can actually go to those and see past participants who have participated before where they're like, oh, I remember this one, you know, person I wanted to visit and here, you know, we've actually sent out that link to people who were inquiring about past participants. So it's a really good opportunity to get your name out there even far beyond the actual festival. Um, and then we actually had a question, if we could just review really quickly that first question, um, Heather, if you want to, again, kind of review about um, the photos of the three to five objects, um, they had to step away really quick. So if we could review that really quick, it'd be helpful. Sure, no problem. Yes, so I just said, even if you only have five different keychains of the letter A, but you do see some differences in color or differences in placement of the flowers in the resin or um, any differences you can highlight, even if they seem the same, offers the application process to have more time to uh, to really enjoy the work you've made. So I would still submit multiple photos and just find differences where you can. Thank you for reviewing that. I hope that that um, answered. And, and like I said, again, if you have um, more questions, follow up questions to your questions, if we don't get to those, feel free to email us at artisancoordinator at craftlakecity.com or you can give, a, uh, give us a call or just visit our website and get the information. Um, we did have another question, Shelby, if you want to talk about the tra traffic pattern. So the question is, what is the typical traffic pattern relative to inside, outside, and day of festival? And um, I'm assuming that means to our website or um, in general at the festival. Sure. So um, the DIY festival historically um, was held at the Gallivan Center. And then in 2019, we actually moved to the Utah State Fair Park, which is a larger venue and was really exciting for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons being that now it's an indoor outdoor festival. Uh, so we actually have buildings where artisans uh, can be indoors with air conditioning and so can the attendees. Um, STEM exhibitors can as well and an indoor workshop area. Um, and we also have really fun activated outdoor spaces. So it truly is an indoor outdoor space. And we saw um, without any specifics um, that I can give you right now, uh, attendees enjoying both aspects of the festival because um, there are really fun things to do inside and outside. So um, I think what we saw is the attendees utilizing both. I hope that answers your question. Um, let me know if it didn't. <laughs> Well, I want to be mindful of everyone's time and thank you all for attending the Application Assistance Day. We didn't have another question, but we did have a thank you um, that the information was very helpful and especially about the photo information. So I want to thank um, Heather Leafling again um, for being here and sharing um, your tips and insider, insider tips and knowledge about applying and taking your own photos. It was, it was super informative, so thanks so much. And um, thanks everyone for attending. Like I said, we will be posting this recorded video online so you can review it if you have, um, if you need a little refresher. We'll also be holding another Application Assistance Day event on Monday, April 5th at 6 p.m. So if there's no more questions, we'll just say thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. And um, we look forward to getting your application. <laughs>